Hi, it's Tuesday, the 17th of November, and I am continuing to work my way through John's Gospel, reading and wondering. Today we're in chapter 16, verses 16 through 33. And again, we're still in that passage. It seems like a long monologue by Jesus. John has constructed a long speech by Jesus as Jesus explains to his followers, to his disciples, who he is, who God is, who they are, what they can expect. Pretty much everything that we sort of picked up in the narrative of John's gospel, but now he's just sort of laying it out for you in Jesus' words. Um, so we've been talking uh, most recently about Jesus going to the Father uh, and the Holy Spirit coming, the Advocate coming when Jesus is gone and how the Father is in him and he is in the Father and the Spirit abides in them and we in this all this connection. Lots of good Trinity stuff in there, but also good stuff for us in terms of how we connect. Um, so I'm just going to pick it up there and, uh, and keep going. Uh, so John 16, this time we'll read verses 16 through 33. And of course, Jesus is still talking. A little while you will no longer see me. And again, a little while you will see me. Then some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying to us a little while and you will no longer see me? Again, a little while and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. They said, What does he mean by this a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. And Jesus knew they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, are you discussing among yourselves what I meant when I said, a little while and you no longer see me? And again, a little while you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will have pain, but your pain will turn into joy. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when her child is born, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. So you have pain now. But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. On that day you will ask nothing of me. Very truly, I tell you, if you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be complete. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures, but will tell you plainly of the Father. On that day you will ask in my name. I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I come from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and I am going to the Father. His disciples said, Yes, now you are speaking plainly, not in a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need to have anyone question you. By this we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? The hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each one to his home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you face persecution, but take courage. I have conquered the world. Well, <laughs> things that leap out to me right away. Um, boy, it does feel to me like John is writing this uh, from the perspective of a couple of generations and a chance to um, sort of manage uh, to understand history and to have Jesus' words correspond to what has been experienced and what will be experienced. Um, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not doubting. I... I um, the idea that that Jesus is telling the disciples exactly what's going to happen with his with his crucifixion and then resurrection and ascension, um, I don't know. I don't know that I personally doubt that, but I don't know if John knows that. Uh, but I think John wants us to have that sense. Again, um, we don't want to have a random chaotic element involved in this. We want God to be in charge. And so Jesus knows everything that's going to happen. And of course, God is in Jesus and Jesus is in God. If God knows everything, then Jesus needs to know everything. So Jesus would have the ability to tell everybody what's going to happen and comfort them before it happens. In a little while, you will be scattered. 
I mean, we know that they were afraid and they ran and they hid as you would expect them to do. Um, so here in John, um, Jesus is saying exactly that. Is that because John is constructing that narrative or because it really happened that way? I, I can't say for sure. Um, it's, it's, it's tricky. So I, I do, I wonder a little bit about it, but again, John has never really claimed to be writing a, an historically accurate account. This is not journalism. He has written a sermon. For him, Jesus is a character. I mean, a real person, absolutely, but within the gospel, Jesus is, um, plays an important role. It becomes the, the bridge, the narrative bridge. Jesus acts very human and yet reveals God so profoundly. So we get this sense of, of God and humanity being at one in Jesus. In John's gospel, Jesus goes around all the time saying, I am, I am, I am. And if you recall a few podcasts ago, I, I mentioned that. That's the, the great I am, God. Um, when Moses asked who he is, God uh, saying, I am that I am, which is what Yahweh basically indicates um, by way of um, anagram, I guess that would be. Um, so, no, I don't know that Jesus ran around saying, I am, I am, I am all the time. But John wants to make sure that Jesus says that. Because John wants me to know who Jesus is, and that's important. So it feels to me a little of this has has happened. Um, that um, you know, recognizing uh, the persecution of the Christians that will that will come, people being uh, arrested, um, tortured. Uh, Jesus's words comfort us if we're in that situation. So whether it's historically accurate or not, the faith of it is accurate. And, and, and the truth of it is accurate. I, I do believe that God uh, is with us. And I, and I love the, 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 the birth metaphor. I think that's, that's a, a really good one. Not just if you are living in first century Jerusalem. I think it's a good one in 2020. I think it was probably a really good one in 1912 too. I don't know, I just picked a year. Um, but I, I think we've all had moments um, let me just go to verse 20. Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. I think we know what that's like. I mean, I, I, I've had moments of personal grief where I am sad and I wonder why, why do I have to keep living? Why do I have to keep going? And the world seems to be going on and people seem to be having fun and doing things. Um, and I just don't understand that. Well, that's exactly what, what Jesus has just described to me. Um, the world um, will be rejoicing and you will be weeping and mourning. I get that. I also get it when it happens in, 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 um, in sporting events, in political events, in, in life of the community, where we've gone um, to, uh, to loggerheads and, and one side has triumphed over the other. So one side is weeping and mourning and the other side is, is cheering. I've been on both sides um, and it's way more fun to be winning and cheering, uh, way more fun to be doing that than weeping and crying. Um, but then there's that beautiful metaphor that Jesus uses. Um, when a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. Just right there. So the pain that you're feeling is not is not the coming of death, but is in fact the beginning of new life. And then it takes a step further to say, and when that life is there with you, you forget about the pain. Um, yeah, I've heard that story, but as a man, I have no idea whether that's really true. Um, so uh, I, I think you might remember some of the pain, um, but I, I don't know what I can tell you. Um, but I like the way that, that, that Jesus has done that, or John has used Jesus to, 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 to say that. But, that the the difficult times that we are in, uh, it's helpful to see them as as birthing pangs, right? Um, this is this is labor. This is giving birth to something that will be that will be life. Um, that it will be full of potential and promise, uh, and and full of joy. So even when it's hard now, and and I think it's fair 
to to imagine that in most of our hard times i i think it's a lousy thing to say to somebody if somebody is grieving or hurting uh, or whatever it is and say don't worry this is just like birth pangs and you're gonna be fine you're gonna forget all about it that's a crappy thing to hear <laughs> when you're not ready to hear but it's a wonderful thing for me to remind myself when I'm going through hard times wait a minute this is like giving birth I, I am part of something that will be life-giving and this is hard now but my faith reminds me that God is still active in this. And so what if what if what I want is just and right, then it will come to be, and my sacrifice now, my hurting now, will somehow help that. There is comfort in that and faith in that. And really for me what it is, it's just a simple reframing. Often when I'm hurting, when I have been defeated, I think, well, I am now another step closer to death. Uh, everything I have done has been for naught. Or I can say, so what I'm experiencing now is difficult and hard and hurtful and discouraging. It, it's, it's pain, but it's birth pain because God is the midwife. God is in charge of this and we will, we will end up better than where we started. I, I, I like that. Um, so I, I thank John for that. And I wonder if he knows how much I needed to hear that. Um, because I do from time to time. I really do need to hear that. Um, and then he says another neat thing for me. Um, I will see you again. Your hearts will rejoice. No one will take your joy from you. So, so that, that, that time is going to come when it's great. And if you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you haven't asked anything in my name. But ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. I wonder, is that a little test? I mean, if you're with Jesus and you understand who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing, do you really need to ask anything? You know, when that moment comes that he says, you know, when we recognize that these birth pangs are actually giving birth to, to, to life, they're not, they're, not, they're not death pangs, they are birth pangs. When that happens and we are in community directly with God, and we can ask God anything we want in name. We don't have to ask the Jesus. We can ask God directly. It says that. What would you ask for? Surely, surely being at one with God is all you could ever want or need or hope for. And so in those moments when you don't have anything to ask for, is that when you know you're closest to God? The wanting is gone. The need to ask for something is gone. Um, so as long as we're wanting or hoping this thing will happen, we're not there yet. I wonder, just because Jesus says it quite often in John's Gospel, if you ask anything of the Father in my name, you will get it. And again, it sets up this holy concierge thing. This Jesus who just gets us stuff. As if I turned to Jesus and said, you know, I'd really like a strawberry milkshake. Um, could I have that, please? I ask in your name. Boop, one appears. Jesus is not a genie, but the construct is kind of like that, unless we imagine that it's kind of a little bit of a test. I mean, if you're with Jesus and you know that Jesus is God's presence and you know that Jesus is changing the world, do you really need a strawberry milkshake? Is there anything you really need? And, and for me, that's kind of confirmed when, when, when he says to them, that you haven't asked anything. On that day, you will ask nothing of me. Right? When that day comes, you're not going to ask anything of me. You can ask God, but you're probably still not going to ask. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you shall receive, so that your joy may be complete. If you're missing something that would make your joy complete, then maybe you don't recognize in whose company you are. 
Maybe you don't realize the relationship that you actually have. Because if you know the relationship that you have with Jesus, if you know the relationship you have with God, your joy is complete and there is nothing to ask for. I wonder whether that's what John's getting at. And, you know, for somebody who uh, is a musician who loves metaphor as a writer, uh, as a dreamer, um, I still <laughs> resonate with the disciples who say, oh, yes, now you are speaking plainly, not in a figure of speech. Like, oh, my goodness, you're now just telling us how it is. Got it. You're going to the Father. We're going to miss you. But then you'll be back. Huh. But then we're all going to be to the Father one. Okay, thank you for being clear about that and not talking about things we don't understand, like women giving birth and fig trees growing. Another gospel granted. But, um, but every now and again, as much as I love a metaphor, it's kind of nice too just to hear somebody say, here's how this is. Love your neighbor. Got it. Okay, thank you, Jesus. No metaphor there. You just told me what to do. Um, so they say that, yes, now we know that you know all things and you do not need to have anyone question you. Okay, we get it now. By this, we believe that you came from God. We have it now. Do you now believe, Jesus says? Good. The hour is coming. Indeed, it actually has come when you will be scattered, each to his home, and you will leave me alone. It's as if Jesus is speaking pastorally here. As if John has Jesus speaking pastorally about that moment when they're all going to abandon Jesus. Right? Um, as if to make sense of it. So in this, we, we make the apostles not seem such bad guys. And we make it seem as if Jesus certainly knows everything going on. So we maintain that divine sight knowledge. Uh, and we keep our, our, our disciples, our apostles being good guys. Because he says to them, you will leave me alone. Yeah. You will be scattered each to his own home and you will leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. It's okay that you guys couldn't stand with me. It's okay that you guys were afraid because God, God was with me and I was all right. Which isn't quite the same as saying I didn't need you. Uh, or at least it's the same as saying it's okay. I, I understand. It might have been nice if you had, but it's okay. Don't feel bad about that. Don't feel guilty because the Father is with me. I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. Right? Because I got to imagine they felt pretty bad. In the world you face persecution, but take courage. I have conquered the world. So this to me is very pastoral. It's very uplifting. It's, a, it's, it's great to those in the first century who were facing persecution and were running to hide and wondering if they'd made a horrible mistake um, and just hoping that Jesus would show up, just show up right now and, and, and knock the empire down. Um, take courage. I have conquered the world. It's already happened. We're just going to have to wait for it. And oh my goodness, I got to tell you, it's kind of, you know, that's a very November 2020 uh, when you have a, an incumbent president. Uh, in the United States, um, not really willing to concede um, <laughs> to uh, to the president-elect. Um, <laughs> wow, I didn't really see that until just this this moment. Uh, but take courage; I have conquered the world, Jesus says. But don't worry, I I have won this, and we just we just got to get through the messy bits. But I have won this. Um, Jesus is not talking about a couple of months. Um, we don't know what Jesus is talking about in terms of time other than the promise that, that Jesus has won this, that all of this, all of this comes into relationship with God. We do all get where we're going whenever the time is right. I'm going to stop rambling now because I start getting political or I'll start sermonizing. Uh, who knows? Um, but wow, I didn't know there was much in this for me until I started talking. And I find there's a lot of this, a lot in this for me. I hope there's something in it for you. And I hope there's someone that you can share it with and wonder uh, together about it. Wonder about the metaphors. Uh, wonder about, you know, so if we ask Jesus for something, are we really going to get it? Why does Jesus keep saying that? 
And, uh, and what does it mean when Jesus says, take courage, I have conquered the world? Hmm. Or wonder about whatever else jumped out from this reading for you. For now, let us pray. Loving God, we don't like to struggle. We don't like when things are difficult. We don't like the pain of loss. And yet, God, you invite us to see all things as labor pains, birth pangs, pains that may be devastating in the moment, but are all part of our journey to you, all part of emerging life. So God, keep us focused on life. Help us recognize that our struggles are indeed part of the process, part of creating, and that what we are in the midst of, when even when it's hard and difficult, is actually holy and life-giving because you are part of it. Help us to see that, God. Help us to love that. Help us to trust it. Help us to know that you are always with us. We pray through the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. And friends, I think that's enough of me for the day, but I look forward to checking in with you tomorrow. Until I see you tomorrow, just know I appreciate you. Uh, but even better than that, God sees you. God loves you. And God's love is spread by you. God bless you. See you tomorrow.